Gavin, uh, here today to talk about the life and times of the Black Count. Uh, I was one of two singers. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much my role. I'm Sean Smith and I'm the singer from the Blackout, singer in the loosest possible terms. I'm James Davis or Bob and I am one of the guitar meisters in the Blackout. Um, I'm Matthew and I play guitar in the Blackout. My name is Rhys Lewis, um, I'm formerly in the band The Blackout. I am Gareth Snores Lawrence, drummer of the now defunct rock band The Blackout, South Wales legendary number one. The Blackout started from me and Matthew was sitting in, I, th I want to say it was history or science class together, it's one of the two, and Matthew was already in another band and he decided he wanted to make a heavier band. So I said, let's start a band. And he said, yeah, let's do that, but what can you do? And I said, yeah, that's a good point. I've got no musical talent whatsoever. Uh, Snoz uh, worked with a friend of mine in town in a sports, sports store. So we went down, said, do you want to be in a band? He said, yeah, <laughs> that was that done. And uh, one of Gavin's friends knew Snoz, so we, we also kind of started from just friends and just wanted to do something really just to pass some time and have some fun with our lives, I guess. Again, just it, everyone just seemed to be up for it because there was nothing else to do really in Merthyr at the time. The first practice ever was in like a kind of, uh, kind of like a little, little crashy room, I think, for like uh, youths. Like they'd come in like, uh, it was like a social kind of club thing and we went up above that club. And I uh, just started jamming loud music. And there was, there was quite a lot of chavs that came up and they were like, What's going on upstairs? And then there was these six or five at the time actually. Um, uh, yeah, gothics upstairs making a, making a racket. So we railed someone up, I guess, from the start. So. I started speaking to Sean and he um, mentioned, we were talking about being in a band together and he just said, well, why don't you just like play guitar for the band I'm in now? So I went down to Cardiff one afternoon, about two days after I finished university, and just to jam out some songs that I'd like learnt about two days before. That went quite well. And then they went, we've got a gig tonight, do you want to do that? And I went, okay. And then apparently I was in the band from that point on. It was, I don't know, it's kind of, oh. When it came to songwriting, we kind of all put our own, our own ideas in the pot. Like, I can't play guitar or any musical instrument, but um, I knew what I liked melody-wise and yelling-wise. There's not been one songwriter. Everyone has equal input. And then, even if, if a lot of us think the idea isn't quite what we thought, we'd give it a go anyway. And then, like, like I said, sometimes it'd turn out, you're like, yeah, yeah, that works great. We should, how, how did I never see that? I think that's probably why we stayed together so long, was the fact that we were all, it was always like that, like it wasn't like, this is my song, this is how we have to do it. And um, one, of the, one of the main things we learned from being in a band, and I learned from Jason Perry, was that nobody in the band is bigger than the song. It shouldn't be an ego, there shouldn't be a solo that goes on too long, or a singing part that's too much. It should all be what's best for the song. Beijing Cock, there was, I think it was, the main riff was Matt's, the one in the, uh, the, the one that kind of like runs through the song. And then we, I played around with some like verse ideas and they kind of got stuck together. Um, it was a bit of a divisive one for their single. It was one of the songs that really came together in the studio when we were doing um, We Are The Dynamite. Maybe not one that going into it we thought was going to be a real standout track, but then when everything was put together, we went, oh, wow, this is like, this, this chorus is really like, soars along. Ladies and gentlemen, introducing the blackout. We jammed some songs together. I came up with a riff. <laughs> the video came about because our old manager kind of uh, let us down, and uh, we were supposed to have a video with a guy from like Crank or one of those kind of like British films. And it never happened really, so like last minute we had no videos, so we uh, sort of made one ourselves of all the like, footage we'd filmed over the last like year, like just being on tour and our friend uh, Ramesh was nice enough to help us out 
borrow some cameras. It was kind of DOA kind of thing. So yeah, it's kind of a. I guess it kind of summed up the band. Kind of just you know, that's the time and the place kind of thing. Spent like the afternoon doing shooting bits for it. They had, they played the music through the monitors, and I think if you watch any of that video, you'll see that we're not really playing in time because I was just constantly getting everything as hard as I could because I thought oh, that's what you do, and we weren't playing along in time. Well, I wasn't anyway to, to the music, but it was cool. Um, I didn't expect, like I said, when when the video came, actually came out then it went on online. It was class. People loved it, and then it was actually being shown on TV, and I was, I blew my mind. Very sweaty, if I remember correctly. Very, very sweaty. And for some reason, I was in a, we're in a headband. I don't know if that helped or made things worse, really. But um, I think the perception of the band was a bit of an interesting one at that point. I think by the time we were getting that first record out and the first kind of singles, we'd done quite a lot of touring and quite a lot of like playing in front of people. And I think we were conscious of the fact that there was a little bit of sort of interest, positive and negative, for the band. Um, I think a lot of people were kind of like into what we were doing and we seemed to be having good like kind of responses from the people we were playing in front of and the bands we were supporting. Uh, hello and welcome to uh, Jen and her flatmate's kitchen. Oh! It's lovely, I may add. Jen, you've, you've kept the place very nice. Well done. When we came here earlier I was covered in shit but she cleaned up. She's cleaned up since then. She said she could clean up but she was right. <laughs> Do it, do, do, do it. Don't worry about the shit, boys. I'll clean that up. Literally shit on the walls. Thursday, yeah. Literally. I guess um, we kind of uh, a new new kids off the block around that time. <laughs> the first release we did was <laughs> the blackout, the blackout, the blackout, which is, as was most our titles in the early years, a massive in joke. Uh, at the time, I think Lost Profits had a, uh, I think it was Start Something was about to come out and we were joking with them, we said, saying, oh, you should say Lost Profits, Lost Profits, Lost Profits by Lost Profits because when someone says that on the radio, it's going to sound ridiculous, but uh, they shit out, so we stepped up <laughs> like dickheads and uh, named it three times after ourselves, which is strange. Now it's just called the blackout times three because we can't be asked to say it so many times. Uh, but yeah, that was our first release and that record was with uh, Ramesh Dodengoda in his parents' side room next to the, you know, the living room with a drum recording area, which was like just about big enough to put Snoz's drum kits in. I think there was like, that much between a cymbal and a wall. And uh, yeah, that was kind of our first long recording experience. You know, we were there for like two weeks or whatever. And uh, now it's, it's cool. Like we started there with Ramesh in his parents' second room. And we kind of grown with him then to the next record, which was uh, Wheel of Dynamite. We had a studio down in Cardiff, Longwave. I guess we weren't like, you know, the biggest band and the most professional or tightest sounding band, but we did our best with what we had, I guess. Getting like things like record label, I mean, we got when Fierce Panda were interested, that was great. I mean, it wasn't as if we had our pick of hundreds to choose from, but it came along at the right time and it all sort of resolved itself pretty straightforward. They came to see us, they liked us, they said, do you want to do an EP? We went, yeah, that would be great. That's exactly what we're doing. So yeah, it was all, that all kind of just sort of like, we weren't in any great rush at that point. We were just seeing how it was going, you know? We didn't want to force it. We were kind of lucky enough that a guy called Guy, guy Loman, who was doing uh, PR for uh, Fierce Panda, he came to see us play in uh, a little town, a little small show, and he, uh, he asked us, do we want to be signed? To which we said yes. And that was before kind of any management got involved, really, which is strange, because we, we had two releases before we really had a a manager on board. We got told that we had to write our album by our, our record label in like, and we only had about six weeks to do it. So in between touring everywhere, playing every little toilet you could imagine, uh, we had to write an album and get it recorded in, in probably in about six, six to eight weeks, which was uh, 
which was difficult to say the least, but we, I think we produced one, you know, one of the be best, one of the better things that we'd, we'd ever done, probably because of the pressure we were under. It's a court order saying that uh, we're a statutory nuisance. Yeah, when we left Fierce Panda, I believe, I'm probably making this up, they, they told us we had one of the biggest selling first week records with We Are the Dynamite that they, they've ever put out, which I think was like 12,000 in the first week, which by today's standard would probably be top five, top five. Back in the day, it was like 128 or something like that. Early days, it's the most important, one of the most important people who took a chance on us was Johnny Phillips. Um, Johnny's a divisive character. <laughs> Just chat. He's in here, you gotta find him. It's a game. Alright. Here you are. We, we uh, try to get a bunch of different people involved for management. And uh, it's always handing out C CDs and demos and come to the show. And so, yeah, we were told that we could never do anything. And I once gave our CD to a promoter called Johnny Phillips. And I gave him the CD. And uh, I saw him a week later. And he said to me, and I swear to God, it's the first time has anyone ever said anything this blatant to me. It was, you guys are fucking shit, and I will never work with you. When he said, uh, I will never work with you, it was quite early on uh, when, when we were a band. So it was, that's, that was almost a daily occurrence for us. You know, we, we play shows to literally no one. I mean, I never use the word literally out of context. There was the other band, and then we played the first song, they left, because they were a metal band. And they were headlining as well, so there's no one there, so we, we weren't quite all on our shoulders. But they would leave, and then the song guy left. And we were like, we're in Barfly, and there's no one here. We had the fucking last laugh, because he ended up managing us, and then we sacked him, so... Man. But if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't be here today, so he's, he's alright, he's alright, but... This is about being told you're never good enough to live your dreams. We are fucking proof. If I can live my dream like I have for the 13 years, anybody with a fucking brain can do it. So after tonight, I want you to go out and I want you to pursue whatever dream it is, unless it's fucking mental illegal, and then that's just wrong and you're a fucking idiot. It turns out we ended up getting on really well with Johnny. Hi, I'm obviously Sean Smith. Going to LA with him and shooting, we shot two videos out in LA with Johnny and we had some other time of our lives with him as well. The man's a nutter. End of the We Are The Dynamite Cycle was like great, we'd done a bunch of cool touring, we'd done the Astoria show which was just mind blowing and that was like a really like big, big like milestone to sell that out. Technically unsigned at that point as well because we'd already decided that we weren't going to go with Fierce Panda and we were looking as to where we were going to go next. Get that camera on my face! Get that camera on my face! When we sent to Epitaph, we'd just spent, like I said, a year and a half just constantly touring. And we, and we had an inkling that there was a couple of labels interested. I think Sony were interested at one point, so we met the girl from Sony a couple of times. Sony's attitude of, can we get two more hit singles about a week before we were scheduled to go to Texas to record, meant that we decided against honouring that demand. Johnny told us, because Johnny was managing us at the time, and he said, oh, Epitaph are interested. I didn't know much about Epitaph, because the bands on Epitaph were, I, I didn't really know much about them, so I didn't know much about them, but Reese and a couple of boys were like, oh, it's, it's a big deal, it's, it's, you know, they're a big, big label, they're not a major label, but they're a big label. Kind of learned quite early on not to get too excited about stuff, because like, things always fall apart and break down. The, the head guy of Epitaph Europe came to, came to Cardiff, and we had to set up, it was like an audition for the X Factor, it was, probably one of the hardest things I've ever experienced because we were complaining for this guy who was head this label and he was going to make or break it. So he came, he flew in from Holland and uh, we met him and he seemed really stern and really, I was like, oh God, this is going to be a nightmare. So we set up in the practice rooms in, in Cardiff and we set up against the wall, all of us, and we played to him and Johnny. And uh, we played, we only had four, I think it was maybe three, three or four songs finished properly. But we played the four, 
and then I think Johnny was like, oh, got, got any more on that? I was like, oh, yeah, got any more? And we were like, oh, no. Oh, so, like, so I think we played one more, which we'd hardly finished, but he listened to it, and he was like, oh, right, no, nice to meet you. And so we went, we, we drove, I think we drove him back to his hotel in our really old stinky van, which was, which was minging, and, uh, and then we spent some time just having a chat, and then he went home, and then Johnny said to us, oh, yeah, he wanted to, wanted to sign us, which was wicked. The position we were in, you, you could not turn down a label like Epitaph. They, they were a fantastic label. Still to this day, like we've got no qualms with them. They, they were all beautiful people. They were all lovely to us. And it was then in that kind of like interim period that we started talking to Jason and started writing both for Jason's input to come in and then doing the pre-production with Jason himself. Um, that was in the end of 2008. Sing black out. That's what it's wrong side of the mic. That's what I'm screaming it. Oh, black out. We had so much artist control over what we wanted. They they said we're not going to step in and say, you "Should do this song or this song or this song," which was amazing for us. And then that's the first time we ever started working with Jason Perry, which um, was a star-studded event for us because we were massive fans of it. And we told everyone we'd finished twelve songs for the album. And we'd finished one song, had two kind of like 99% written, and but eight songs like no one had done. And uh, Jason came down to Cardiff, and uh, he'd been like working with McFly the night before, and he'd uh, supposed to be working with Rod Stewart. So he had all these stories like, oh, I was doing this thing, I was like, I was supposed to see Rod Stewart last night, and he didn't turn up, and we were like, uh oh, what the hell is he doing with us? Probably one of the best things that ever happened to the band. Um, he made us um, realize we, well, he, he taught us how to write, I guess. I'm Jason Perry, I'm a record producer and a songwriter and uh, my job is to go in the studio with bands and take the good bits and make them even better and take the bad bits and make them good and um, turn a bunch of demos into a, a great record. What's your email address? Jason Perry Rock at the f oh, One word. More! No, it's several words. It's the only email address in the world that's got separate words in it. Fucking idiot! What WWE? More. First, with the blackout in, I don't know what year it was. I think it was 2007 or eight. And um, a mate of mine called me and said, "You want to go see this band at the Astoria?" So I went down to see them. It was them, and we are the Ocean. And I met the manager Johnny beforehand, and went out for dinner and talked about potentially doing a record with them. And I remember going to the gig and seeing thousands of kids going crazy. And, um, and then the band came on and played and they were really good. And then they played this new song called Children of the Night. And I remember thinking the best bit of the song was the ending. And I thought, that should be the chorus. Oh mate, uh, that Children of the Night song's awesome. You want to use that Children of the Night? We are the Children of the Night as a chorus, not just the middle bit. And I remember thinking, yeah, that's not, that's not a bad idea. But then, you know, I, I thought it would get sick. Uh, people would get sick of it or whatever. We are the children. We are Sean, 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 do what? it again. Yeah. But imagine, there's something wrong with it. Um, um, I think years of years of experience. Um, what would Alec Clay do? Mm, that, it'd probably make you sing it with that your ball kind of hanging out and you fly. Just one ball. Ah, yeah, that's what I want to do. Try that. All right, ready? I'm thinking about it, yeah. Um, go down, hear a bunch of songs, sit in a crappy rehearsal room in, in Wales, um, which was alright actually, it wasn't crap, it was nice. Down a bit, Sean. It's gonna so now, heat rises, heat rises, down a bit. Down. Yeah, even though I'm the, I'm the rock star here, Turn. I've got to record vocals with this mic here and heat Jason with a heater because we're in this cold rehearsal place. Yeah, Jason was like a complete inspiration. He's like one of the best people I've ever met. Um, he, yeah, he completely trans transformed our band. I remember when we were, when we were writing, I remember being really, really pissed off at first, because he was coming in and he was like, oh, we should change this and we should change that. And I was just thinking, well, it's our band, you prick. Like, don't come in now and just change everything. Keep Drinking tea in a good old fashioned uh, see-through mug. Um, Jason's over there with his mood light. He's, we had to go all the way back to his house, which is about 60 miles away and um, to get a preamp, I don't even know what that does, 
But he had to get one. He's um, annoying. So one of his kids, he gave me a forced wave that Jason made him made him wave to me. So he clipped it on the head. And wave! And he, wave boy! And he punched, Slap! He punched, wave boy! <laughs> then he punched him in the back of the head. What was that wave? Yeah, there's some really good songs and then we wrote a bunch together. A one, two, three, four! <laughs> I remember walking into this rehearsal room and I remember Sean sitting there doing absolutely nothing. Give me some love, give me some With everybody else set up and he was just sitting there on the internet. And I was thinking, why doesn't he help? And I said to Sean, you're not carrying any gear? And he goes, oh, I've carried this band every day of my life. I'm not carrying any guitars, see? I thought, I like this kid. He didn't, he didn't talk like that. So like this, we went from having like one song finished, like children being finished, to having like an album finished in two weeks with Jason, because he'd just come in. And all the bits we were kind of like, we'd have a song kind of like finished, like to the middle, like to the middle of the song. We kind of like, we didn't know where to go from that middle. And Jason was like amazing, like coming in and going like, you just need to change one chord. If we change that one chord, you've got a finished song. Oh, I carried this man every day of my life, see? That's how he spoke. And then I said, I'm Jason. Hi, nice to meet you. And Sean said, were you in a band called A? And I said, yeah, we had a number five single with a song called Nothing. And he went straight on his phone and went, says he a number nine. <laughs> I was like, fuck. So yeah, my first two minutes with a the band, they kind of sussed me out. Yeah, I'm Jason. You might know my band from such hits as the number six, but really in reality, in real life, number nine song, and Nothing. And I'm Sean. The closest I've watched the top 40 is when it's number 36! <laughs> <laughs> you told us, you know, it's, it's not it's an hard work, it's, you know, it's just you and your mates just recording an album at the end of the day. It should be the, one of the most fun things you can, you can probably do ever, and it was. I've just got to keep the magic and um, get rid of all the, all the bad stuff around the magic and just retain that and simplify it, so... We're the best in town! The big gang on best in town. Right, Dan, just, just a little bit in the mid 80s. It's the best in town, all of us. We're the best in so town. So he just goes, yo, can't bring us down. We're the best in town. We're the best in town! That Children of the Night song, I think the We Are the Children of the Night was like some end thing. And I said, you know, that should be the chorus. And I think we worked on it for 10 minutes and he was like, yeah, cool. The chorus, so you can see he showed us how to, how to how to write songs, probably how to go from like into different keys, probably and stuff, and how to do it do it that way because we'd ne obviously we'd never met anyone like this who'd actually never met a proper musician before, even though we were supposed to be proper musicians. Yeah, it's, you know, it's fine. Since the chorus is coming, it's gonna have almost like a swing to it, about yeah. it. First and only time we went abroad then. So I said to the label, we've kind of got to text us, get this band away from Kerrang, get them away from, you know, TV and their peers and Kerrang magazine and Rock Sound and Metal Hammer, you know, every other band and just get them away from there and let's go make a proper organic rock record with big drums and big guitars and just get them out of their comfort zone for two weeks. So that's what we did. I don't think there was any pressure really on the album because we were just confident in ourselves, I guess. like the. I didn't feel any pressure anyway, like to, like to me there wasn't pressure, but um, yeah, we were just out there on the time of our lives, like um, messing about with guns, like the owner of the studio came and bought his arsenal, one, well, a third of his arsenal one day, which was 12 guns. I'm sure it's cold and everything, I've met him once, I talked to him about a mixing desk, now he's got a massive gun. All he's got to do is turn around and kill me, and that's that. You can't run, because that's good, like, I'm really powerful. I can't, but I'm looking at places to hide behind, you can't be out now. Oh, Jesus, fuck me, get some! What has happened? Wait, let's have a look at the aftermath. <laughs> what time does Tim Henman go to bed? Tennis? 
Okay. I'm a seventh member of their band. The L singer. L singer. Actually, I've sang a lot of blackout songs. If you listen carefully, you can hear. Yeah, Monkey! Monkey! Stop you! And save us all! <laughs> In a lot of their songs. And I think most bands I work with, McFly, all often catch me recording backing vocals or doing stuff. So I'll say to the boys, remember doing a McFly record once in Australia and they had surfing lessons every day and they started getting in the studio about one and then it was more like two and then it was more like three. I remember one day they came early and I was set up this entire percussion tree and all these different mics and I'm sitting there doing all these backing vocals and I just turned around and there's Tom and Danny. They've been watching me for half an hour. Here's another song for the radio, song for the radio. What are you doing, Chase? <laughs> to dub it? <laughs> Singing on your album? Why are you doing that? I don't know. I thought it'd sound good. Are you in the band, Chase? No? Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll tape over that then. But the blackout, I got away with it because they were never there when I did that. So I'm on a lot of their songs. Whoa, ah, that was me. Oh, ah, we are the children of the night. And all that. We are the children of the night. We nearly had Pharrell, Pharrell Williams, nearly um, featured on the song. Yeah, and we'll do duplicate this, we'll do we'll some tambourine and a little scrape as well. I just want to get a couple of bars down. If you listen to the children and I carefully, there's a bit in there where you can hear like percussion in the middle. It goes ding 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 ding. Jason Perry did that in a sombrero because he thought um, Pharrell likes percussion. So that little bit being on the song is because we were having Pharrell on the song until. I got in touch with him, and the week we were recording the parts that he would have had to have done, um, his, his girlfriend at the time had a baby, so he ended up not being on it, which is heartbreaking, but just the fact that I got to meet him was, was mind-blowing, and um, yeah, we had no, we didn't, we knew the record was, was quite good. <laughs> Everyone thinks that, like, because me and Gavin are front men, that we could, you know, possibly have like rock star attitudes. But I think we're still quite nice. Whereas Snoz demanded drum tech. Well, yeah, I did request. I, it wasn't so much a solid gold kit. I wanted all the rims solid gold, and like I wanted the actual shells platinum. Bass Gara, Matt Charles, his, his drum tech. Bass Gara. That's Charles. You'll be seeing a lot of them together. That's my foot. That's my foot. It's not happy. Look, look, move that float on. If, if you look, that, that kit is actually 24 carat gold. No, it is. And no, 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 I'm not kidding. Well, it actually is. It's plated. We demanded that. Tomorrow, it doesn't make it sound any like better, right? you just wanted it. Bit of bling like on it. Yeah, so we got uh we got Charles doing doing some piano for us. You may have met uh, saw him in uh, earlier earlier videos. He works here at Sonic Ranch and uh, apparently he can uh, tinkle the ivories, so uh, we're gonna get him to uh put, lay down some piano for us. So yeah. Let's go check that out. That's it, she should go. Second the D shot should go. Guitar. Can't say I have, but. Yep, that's a stunt. There's the album. In that box, 
Hopefully I won't lose it tomorrow. Go right, Gav, quick. Uh, right, everyone say goodbye to the Sonic Ranch. Oh, oh everybody gets struck by a beat though. We were really confident about uh, the best in sound once we recorded it and we kind of like we were confident in what we thought it was going to sound like and it just it sounded great i remember when we first we'd come back from texas the boys had recorded the vocals back in the uk well i said to him to, to save money when we were recording the album in texas we were told beforehand it wasn't very likely that we'd get vocals done there so i said to save the boys money well to save us money i don't mind not going because I, I knew the songs we had, I knew how good they would be, and I knew how well the boys could play them. So I was like, I'll just wait. But I remember Jason stamping that down and being like, no, you've got to come. Like, everyone's got to come. It's got to be the same vibe. Like, you've got to have a vibe of the band. So, yeah, we did that, and then we had to come back, and me and Gavin ended up doing the vocals in... Um, it was a... Uh, stables. Yeah, it was an old practice room that used to be a stables, freezing cold in the middle of winter in Leon C with um, Jason Berry. Yeah, I remember wearing a parka and just thinking, this is so different from Texas. This is completely, di like, I could see my breath coming out of me when I was singing. What just happened? Oh, that's it, boys. What, what just happened, Jace? You just finished your vocals for your album. Which means all the tracking is done. It's done, boy. And it's just us three to celebrate. Woo! Yay! And it was actually when Jason, we came to do the, um, the choir of kids who do the beginning of the Children of the Night vocals at the beginning was at a school in Merthyr. So Jason had come up and he had some like masters of what had been like recorded and like what had been mixed and finished basically, but for like the final touches and stuff. And it was mind-blowingly good. We just couldn't believe how good it sounded. Like, this just sounds, it sounds much more expensive. It, I know, it just, but it just sounds like the money had been spent in the right way and, you know, the benefits of doing that, just a whole, it just sounded like a real record. It was a mental experience because that was, a, like say, that was, a, for me, that was the first time we'd ever done an album properly. We'd like, we'd had, like we did the album with Ramesh and beforehand, but obviously it was just in Cardiff, it was just getting up in the morning, driving up to Cardiff, doing our bits, coming home every day, but this is the first time we actually Im immersed ourselves, I guess. Is that the word, immersed? Yeah? Yes, best day ever. The ball kept on ro rolling, I guess, and then we, next thing we know, we're in um, LA shooting these, these videos. Uh, <laughs> big sets, a lot of money, and uh, yeah, good times. I remember Johnny Phillips came to us and said, boys, we should go to LA to shoot the videos. Um, I, can, I think he said he could get a deal. He's kind of the Dell boy with music. Um, he could get a deal on us doing two videos in two days. Chill all the night and save ourselves. And uh, talk about being out of our comfort zone. It was like six Larry Welshmen in the most poshest hotel in well, that says everything. I just said poshest. It's on a set shooting this video for this band. And, uh, Sean's just learning the lyrics for his own song. Mm, that's terrible. When we got there, Johnny was like, oh, because at the time he was really into Entourage. I hadn't seen anybody, but I love Entourage myself. But he was like, we're going to stay at the Mondrian, it's going to be amazing. And because the Mondrian's this big, like, posh hotel. So we got there and I think Epitaph put us up, they put us in the, in the Mondrian and then... The first day we got there, we just spent a day just walking, walking around LA, just soaking it all in and it was, and it was amazing. And then we, we had a meeting set up with Epitaph. So we were like, oh, we'll go there. And they said they'll go there, they'll put on, put on like a spread for us and we'll get to meet uh, Brett Garowitz. He was like, oh, come down, come down and meet everyone. And, we got there, uh, we were knocking on the door. I don't know if you've been told this, but we got there and we, we weren't late. I think we were like probably about 20 minutes early. So we were like, oh, we were there knocking on the door. No answer, knocking on the door. No answer, and, you know, Johnny was like, oh, hey, hey, F in this, F in that. So we were like, oh, maybe they just know you because we were a bit early. So we were knocking on the door, Johnny was phoning in. They finally answered the door. They were like, oh, how's it going, guys, coming in? So I was like, oh, cool. So we went in and people were just were like, oh, all right. And we were like, it just seems weird. This is a bit weird. So we got there and um, the girl on reception was like, oh, um, Brett's not here at the moment, he's just, he's just left. 
which was 20 minutes before we were supposed to be there. So he's like, oh, he's not here tomorrow, he's just left, he's gone to, I think, gone to the studio to, I think it was uh, No FX maybe, were writing a new album and stuff. Or he, was, he said, she, she was like, oh, he's going to check up on the new album and stuff a minute, he shouldn't be too long and all this. And we were like, oh, cool. We shot two videos we shot before, was Beijing, which we just put together ourselves, and the, the high tie video, which was also a bit of a mess and got put together like real, real last minute with about three people working on it. And then we went to LA and there's probably about 60, 70 people working on those videos. It was absolutely amazing. Like it was like catering and like a, a wardrobe department and like people building sets the whole thing was going on. It was ridiculous. Oi, oi. Well, that's way too close for this time of morning. Good morning, peoples. We are something AM, some ridiculous number, like a number before 10 with AM after it. Uh, we're in Los Angeles, City of Angels, to you, and uh, we're in this warehouse doing our video. Videos, two videos. Go introduce ourselves. Here you are with the band. I asked him to paint on Richard's face um, using the most permanent thing he could and he didn't have any paint so he spray painted a sharpie blue so we're gonna draw on his face with sharpie and hopefully he won't come off so we'd ruin his weekend in LA so let's go see what's happening <laughs> I haven't even seen this yet. What was the best part of today for you? <laughs> Spending it with you guys. Why so? You guys are comedians. Tell us about your other job. I've been laughing the whole time I've been here. Reese decided to try and head but LA out of existence. He stuck his head in the floor in the, into the airport. Yeah, so he, uh, he had food poisoning. He fainted, uh, fell up, hit his head on the, in the bus. Because we were in the bus on the way to the plane, he fainted, and the last thing he said was, "Have, have we been told the story yet?" I'll tell you. I'll tell you anyway. The last thing he said was, as he fainted, "Oh fuck!" and he fell out, whacked, whacked the back of his head on the door, and he fell out of the bus and whacked the front of his head on the floor. And I was just about to go. It's the best thing I've ever seen because we—he's always, Reese is always on about people falling. It's his favorite thing. We always on YouTube. He loves a fall compilation, and he fell, and I was like, "This is amazing!" Until he. I looked out and he was on the floor on the tarmac and he was twitching because he'd obviously hit his head. I shouldn't really laugh now, but I can't do anything serious. But at the time I was going to go, I wanted to stand above him and go, yes! But then I was like, oh no, this is serious. So he was on a fit on the floor and uh, we just started panicking, so like, we just didn't know what to do. Johnny was actually sat in Reese's chest, telling everyone to get away from him so he could breathe. And we were like, Johnny, you sat in his chest. Yeah, I had the bleed in the brain. Just at the time, it was, I was fine because I didn't really realize it was happening, but for everyone around me, it was quite horrible, I guess. But then the next thing I knew, I was, I was waking up, um, some uh, doctor was kind of like, the first thing I remember, some guy was above me, hey man, happy St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> it's like, where am I? And we left them without Reese and Gavin and Johnny, the three of them stayed over there. So that was a bit strange, just the thought was coming home then. My family came out. My mother and father came out, um, my girlfriend, she came out, and they were in bits. So I feel worse for the, everyone else around me, really, because it was all a bit of a haze to me. But luckily, but no, you know, long time, long, long term uh, aggravations from it. We just kind of bashed my head and got on with it, I guess. We basically did three years of tour into nobody. Um, we played Cardiff Barfly once, and as soon as we started, the sound engineer left. So we were literally playing to nobody. So rather than being down about that, we were like, oh, it's a free practice. We're getting paid to practice, we're getting like... I remember the first gig we ever, we ever got paid was in the Molster's Arms in pont -de I could not tell you what year, but I'm sure Snoz probably could. Because we had a photo taken with the money. We had 50 quid between the six of us. And we, st we, st we had a photo of all of us like, <gasps> with like 50 quid, just amazed that we were ever getting paid for it. So we did, yeah, we did like two to three years of playing to nobody in small places. Um, and no, yeah, nobody took, took notice of us really. 
it was a weird kind of progression you'd, you'd see, not so much in, in ourselves being professional musicians, but the actual environment we'd, we'd find ourselves in. Sorry, that's all we're allowed to do. Really? Yeah. 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 Oh. In the words of NWA, fuck the police. We had like goals, but we never had goals to be like, I want to play Wembley, or I want to sell a million records, or like, we just had like lit literally little steps. It was play to people, have monitors, um, get a backdrop, I think was one of them. And then like, we always had these like little goals that we went on to achieve and then bit by bit just kind of blew our minds that we were still doing these crazy things. It was always more the environment, I think, that kind of was more professional than we were. We moved through that kind of way. Okay, so thank you guys very, very, very much. Part of the, like, the amazing things that we got to do from, like, Best of Town on and how that felt like such a little step up was that we started doing, like, these festivals that were, like, not just... Because Red and Leeds is huge anyway, and we'd already been lucky enough to do that, but then we got to do things like Puckle Pop, Lowlands, Rock Am Ring. <laughs> I think like the step up kind of like is a bit of a natural thing really like you don't realize it happens because everything just happens like so quick not not quickly but like it's just like one show is slightly bigger than the next and the next one and then like you look back you're like whoa what, when did that happen stop it man <laughs> no <laughs> i need my nose one of the biggest moments for me was when uh, we were lucky enough to support a band called Avenged sevenfold in manchester academy one <laughs> And that was like this huge, huge room. I can't remember what capacity it was, but it felt like a million. <laughs> um, yeah, and that was just like, that was just going from there to like, oh. <laughs> we did Butzerfest, and because it's a big hill at the back, yeah, I decided that I've, I, I wanted all of the crowd that was standing in front of us to go to the top of that hill and either run down there. We did, because we did it twice. We did it two different years. Oh, one year we had people run down there, and the other year we had people doing forward rolls down there. And yeah, it could have been, it could have been really dangerous. One, two, three, go! Well done, Matthew Pest, well done. That's the worst roll I've ever seen. This song is called Top of the World! If you don't know how to forward roll, but then if you don't know how to forward roll, you deserve what's coming to you. It progressed over the years, like from playing Red in and downloading and stuff, and people actually knowing the songs, and, and, and I was thinking, this is amazing. <laughs> Persecution of Pablo, is that, uh, that's the title, is it? Pablo um, deserved everything he got from us. <laughs> he gave it as much as he, as much as he uh, took it. I know probably all our footage is going to be very one-sided against Pablo. Probably deserved it all. What is this? Downloaded. It's a gay app. 
<laughs> Obviously gay. He's pretty on Pablo. I think Pablo would give as much as uh, he got, really. Pabs. Well, <laughs> yeah. He, uh, he took it really well. He dished out loads as well. He's pretty on Pablo. Pablo's probably like my favorite person I met through the band. <laughs> oh, <what a> release, <laughs> Pablo. Pablo's tiny drop. Pablo is a wonderful man. He got us our first kind of uh, proper practice room. He had a little nightclub in um, a little town in South Wales, and he helped us, you know, just he said, come and, come, come and go as you please, and we wrote our first kind of album there in a little basement in his room. Oh, pubs, do you reckon tomorrow? Tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow. Honest now, oh, the question and answer, right? Do you think you could possibly get her intro right? Oh. 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 Oh yeah, loads. Every time play the wrong different bands intro, just wouldn't come on. He's played the intro before we were ready. Sean and Gavin were still in the dressing room. The word said to me was we need to get him on as quick as fucking possible. I said that's so, correct. Right, okay. Next words were said were, okay, give me two play minutes. I need want. to repatch the back of the desk, I'll flash you when I'm ready and then I'll go. No, no, said no, to no, me, no, 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 You flashed him. What did he do? Yeah, he walked off. He didn't flash you back, though, did he? No, no, no. Fuck, exactly. No one, exactly. No, 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 no. no one said to me, "I'll flash you back." Said, I'll flash you when I'm ready, and I'll start the intro. His words were, "All right, no worries." Oh, well then. You guys started the fucking intro. Numb nuts wasn't ready. Neither were the band. So I had to stop the fucking great. intro. Set yourself down a bit. Numb nuts. Had to Shut up. Bring the band on. The last two again. fucking years, have we always gone with? I flashed you. We go. Yeah, but the comedy. Regardless of that, the conversation, <laughs> regardless of how we normally do it, the conversation we had was we need to get the band on as soon as we possibly can. Which I is said, correct. Okay, we're all ready. Give me two minutes. I need to repatch the back of the desk. I'll flash you when I'm done. <laughs> well, that says to me. Your words were. All right, no worries. Oh, I started a fucking intro yeah. after I flashed it. Oh, I got a question. Oh, I got a question. Why did the desk need repatching? Why wasn't it already ready for us? Because the fucking engineer was on the stage, so on the fucking stage end. That sure. needed to come back and repatch my that's desk. A, that's a very good point. Uh, let's read on. Well, the more right, that if was, I had, was the if I had a sound like engineer the, union, the, uh, they'd sue this lot. It's they the it's the been falling off a stage, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Chasing somebody, straightening his ear, doing um, doing push-ups probably. The one story he used to tell us about his different jobs, and he was a, I think he was like a shit shoveler or something at one point, and he used to, he used to go to like, I don't know, farms. He'd go to shit farms. He used to take, this is his words now, mind. He'd go to shit farms and stuff, and he'd have to. He'd have to go have his machines and they'd suck all of like shit out from the body. These, these like cows and stuff had done. But he'd have to be in the back of a van, sometimes in the hot weather, because it'd all go hard. He'd have to make crack and stuff. And he was saying how much he'd fall in and, and all this. But this is a, these are the kind of stories he would tell us all the time. But he would, he'd just come up with some, some of the best stuff we've ever heard. But I think it's because he was so, so fun and so. You know what I mean? You could take a joke, that's why he used to have a, he used to have a pickle in. There'd be times when we'd be in the van, we were driving from Luxembourg once, and they just decided that it was time to, uh, to jump on Pablo and just beat the living crap out of him. We first, um, we first encountered the sitcom Soldiers Boys in, it would have been 2000, it must have been 2009, I guess, when we were doing um, the video for This Is Why We Can't Have Nice Things, which was put together somewhat hastily uh, live shoot in Islington Academy where we asked a bunch of uh, kids to, to show up not expecting them to in their numbers where they basically filled it out um, and able to do a, a live video shoot. Hey, uh, just on my way up to do sound check now for uh, for the video. Uh, it's just a live, sh live show in Islington Academy. A bunch of people come down, some people have been camping outside. Johnny Phillips. Is there oh. still people there? Down there. Down there. That's all people. Pink car. Way too many people. Probably the biggest surprise was Johnny screaming, uh, was it you? In, uh, in Islington Academy. 
Yeah, that that I was like, oh my god, Johnny. Yeah, I just surprised you guys ever come back, really. And we ended up having um, Josh from Me and Six because he sang on the record. He came down and sang with us, and we had a bunch of friends from bands come down. And Josh from Me and Six, uh, you know, the one with the voice like um, a ten-year-old girl, uh, just texted me begging, begging, like literally. pretty pleading. He sent me a photo of him on his knees crying, asking could he be on the album. Oh, offered us some money. I said, money. I said no, but Jason, being the polite man who can't say no to anyone, said yes. So now we've got to find a part for Josh to sing on. Yeah, it was a great day. It was a good day. I remember sitting there and taking a big photo for Krang of all the bands together. And yeah, every, every video we, we've done together, um, I've enjoyed, including The Storm, where at one point I thought I was definitely going to drown. What's up on today? <laughs> we killed him. We <laughs> <laughs> got the shot, Sean. We got the shot. Because I was wearing um, a suit underwater in a pool. And I remember when the boy said, Oh, yeah, Sean, you're going to be in the swimming pool fully clothed. I thought, Oh, that's okay because um, there'll definitely be some sort of uh, scuba gear or something like that, or some scuba diver to come and give me oxygen while I'm. Drown in, technically. But that wasn't the case, no. Hey, uh, we're the Blackout, and uh, we appear on the set of our new video, The Storm. Uh, it features us in a lot of water. Uh, well, not, well, that's it's a bit not of much water, water. It's more spread out than it is deep. I remember at one point asking, what happens if I start to drown? And someone said, oh, it's all right, we'll, we'll pull you out as quick as we can, and we'll just resuscitate you. Like, oh, OK, then fine. We'll plop in with a jellyfish. They specialise in making you as uncomfortable as possible for as long as possible. In the middle of the night, awesome. Using a variety of temperature, time, too hot, too cold, too wet, too dark, too wet and hot, too cold and hot, too wet and cold and hot and long and dark. Those are my, those are my summaries of them all. It's, it's strange, I was talking to Ben during the Wolves, the, the last video we did, and we worked out there's something stupid like nine or ten videos we've done with each other. All the ideas we've had, they've kind of taken and made better. It's, 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 it's been that kind, of, uh, that kind of relationship, and even if it was us under freezing water in Bolton in a warehouse, or us partying in Ibiza, it's, it's always been enjoyable. I used to get really nervous about walking out on stage, but then I suppose after a couple of the tours with Lost Profits, it just felt like home, like stage was home for me. I don't know, it's probably nothing like it really is. It's just like the moment like the kind of lights go down and then they come back up and you walk out and it's just kind of a roar and it's just, I think that moment is amazing every time. And like, even if they get wrestling, like the gig is rubbish, that moment is just, that, mo that moment is always amazing, I guess. When you're coming out on stage and people you shouting your name and stuff, it's just surreal. It's one of those things you never imagine, ever. Especially like, even if it's two people, let alone like 2,000 people. It's all the same. I'm always going out there to try. I knew that we had it in, it, in us to impress people. So it didn't matter who we were supporting, who we were playing with. We were going to go out there and make a mark one way or another. Either people would hate us, which I'm fine with, or would love us. Like, I didn't want people going, yeah, they were all right. I'd rather them go, I hate that blonde fella. He was trying his best to be funny, he felt miserable. 
So when it's a, just a giant rock in the middle of the sea and the only thing, the only place that you can live is around the edge, which is covered in jungles, which is full of deadly predators, uh, it doesn't really sound like my, uh, my idea of fun, but it's amazing. It's just brilliant and the people there are some of the best people in the world. Too many spiders for my liking. Ass. But uh, yeah, it was, we've Mikey, been over a couple Mikey. of times for Soundwave and, and with Lost Profits and it's just an amazing place to be. It's, it's sunny. I can remember one day we went down to Manly in Sydney, did some surfing and then walked up and we had a football so we were kicking out about. I needed a piss. I was half cut so I thought, oh, I should go in the bushes beer and do a pee. Go in the bushes, had a pee and a huntsman the side of my hand, a uh, huntsman as a spider, uh, ran on my dick. And I was the most scared I've ever been in my life. Where's the ball? <laughs> like we went three times and it was always, always uh, an experience. Because the first time, like I say, the first time we went was with Lost Profits. We'd done a lot of stuff with Lost Profits. So um, they, they offered us the shows and the, the guy out there, the, the main promoter is AJ who went up becoming a really good friend over our love of uh, Liverpool FC, which is which is always a good thing. Uh, when we first went over he he like he was he kind of apologized to us from the first time we went and it was like, you know, I'm I'm paying you nothing. I'm paying you hardly anything to be here. But I'm sorry about that, but this you know, we're not you're not playing massive shows like you would in the UK with lost profits. And we were like because we weren't losing money, we were like, oh, don't you worry about it, but we're in Australia, this is this is class. Uh, uh, oh, chill out now. Chill out now, big nuts. Back off, boy. He's coming on me. He's coming on me. I'm worried. Look at them. Look at them swinging, boy. Oh, they're coming up me, Jim. They're coming up me. It's on your shoulder. Look, no, it's over there. They're coming up me, but not in a good way. Look, it's on him. Oh, wait. Oh, yeah. I like you. It's like... Well done, fella. Oh. Pete's oh. face off. Ah! 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 Oh, that really is. <laughs> He's chowing it down. No, 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 I can't do this. <laughs> so, when we were over there with uh, Lost Profits first, we did like, I think it was three shows with, with uh, Lost Profits, and it was, it blew our minds. Because we'd go there, and then it, there would be people waiting at the airports for Lost Profits stuff, but they'd also be waiting for us. So we'd just get off a plane and we'd walk in, and we'd go, oh, this is amazing, not straight down. And then people were like, oh, can I have your autograph of this and that? And we were like, I'm, I'm, I'm as far away from home as I could possibly be, and there's people waiting in the airport for me. And it was blew my mind, absolutely blew my mind. That whole run was amazing as well because we we're in Austria, from Austria straight to Japan. Australia and Japan are those kind of places where you're so far away, it just doesn't seem like you've, it's the same planet almost. You're just so, so the idea that somebody would know who you are, what your band is, own any of your music, heard any of your music, be excited to see you, it's just ridiculous. It's uh, 7 o'clock in the morning and it's yeah. boiling already. It's like and we're in the shade. So we are in Australia, fucking spot on. And um, as the most profits have made it over here successfully on the same flight. And this is my bathroom. Me and Gavin are sharing in our hotel room. This is my bathroom. This is my dishwasher. That's Gavin. He's got his own dishwasher because he's the. I'm not being sexist, but he's the lady of the two, which is me being sexist, I guess. Uh, this is my bedroom. In MTV style, this is where the tragic happens. We're in Tokyo uh, Fish Market. It's what time is it? Um, 13 minutes past five in the morning. Half past five in the morning. Uh, we haven't been to sleep. Quarter past. Quarter past. He said th oh, I think it's 30. Quarter past five in the morning. We haven't been to sleep. So uh, we decided to come down here to see the fish market, which is ridiculous. I didn't realize a big tuna were. They're huge. They're fucking huge. 
And I remember it was like 12 years ago, no, it was pr probably 10, maybe 10 years ago that we went and they had like contactless payment they were using like with cards and like phones. Like you would just pay for anything with your phone. I remember being blown away by it and it's coming now. It's 2015 now and now we are getting it. So they've had it for years. And I remember it just being like the future. Back Sunday, or uh, just from the corner from us. People cared about your band coming. To, you know, they come to your shows. They queue up in line in, in order of their queue, their ticket numbers, which was insane. Yeah, we went over it a bunch of times, and it was amazing. Yeah, the offer came through to go with Lost Profits, which is amazing because Lost Profits are some of our best friends, like the guys in that band. So it was amazing. Just it's basically going on holidays with your friends and like. That's what it was, we, like as soon as we landed, like we all went, oh, come on, let's have an hour's nap and let's go to the beach and that's what we did, like we just hang out every day with the majority of us. With with everything that went down with Lost Profits, um, it's absolutely criminal that a band that was so unbelievable live and on record and as people could be ruined by one man's insane, insane, terrible actions. The Lost Profits thing, I mean, there's, there's nothing more to be said with regards to what happened than not, hasn't already been said. Um, I think the thing that just gets me is the fact that there's not one person in Lost Profits, there were six. And the fact that he's destroyed his own existence is one thing, but the fact that he is at the same point, you know, just sabotage the careers and the legacy of five other people I just find abhorrent because they are some of the nicest most generous good-hearted and genuine talented people that we've ever encountered and have done some of the most for us yeah it just it shocked all of us like it blew all of us away I remember again the text on the 19th of December 2012 from Reese saying Ian was on telly and by then we'd realized that he um, he had some sort of drug problem, I guess. And we all thought he was dead. Like, as soon as I seen that text of Reese, I was like, oh, he's dead, he's overdosed. And he then Reese sent another text saying, he's not dead. Uh, oh, no, he said, he's all right, he's not dead. And then he texts going, well, he's not all right. It's really, really sad. Uh, his stupid, insane actions have ruined it for the rest of them. They're all awesome, so. We were told about Warp Tour by American bands, how hard work it would be. You're not ready for it. You'll never be able to survive or whatever. When it was exactly the same as everything we've ever done in the UK. Like, lugging amps about. Like, I don't know why they didn't expect us to be able to lug our own amps about, but we did. What we just found, Bob? Uh, I'll tell you what we just found. Our tent, son. Didn't expect that, to be honest. Me either. Expected it just to be a basic B and Q gazebo. Um, <laughs> keep fair enough. Let's All go. Right. Let's go have a word with Davis. Some, Davis, some is our boy. you can play. Yeah. I listen to back to. Doing warp tour is one of those like um, opportunities that are, it's a real bucket list thing. I think for a band, I think to be able to go. Oh my God, we're going to do. You know, we're going to do Vans warp tour. That legendary U.S. thing. It was awesome just getting to see people who didn't have a clue who we were again, and then just changing their opinion. I think we lucked out that we bus shared with another band. I think if we did it in a van and drove 10 hours every night in a van, it would have sucked. But we lucked out that we were bus sharing and we thought it was the best thing ever. Jay Smith is uh, pretty much a seventh member of the Blackout. He's just been with us forever and again one of, one of those people we surround ourselves with just for that morale boost I think you that and he's amazing his job 
he's an hard worker, I'll get this out of the way, and um, he's great at what he does, but <laughs> he's the funniest boy you'll ever meet, some of the stuff he comes out with is hilarious, he likes a good story. Mollies, Okay. Ah, Cribs, is he? Yeah, hey yo, welcome to my crib, it's very spacious as you can see, you can either stand up or sit down, yeah, mahogany floor seat, pot shadows, hi, here we are, look, what's happening, son, how are you doing, fella? How are you, how are you, man? This is, uh, this is the living room, there's a friend of mine here, fuck it, that's on my room, I can't, man, you can see me throwing nuts, come here, don't make me a fucking fool now, I'm in front of the crib, so, Come on, dude, this is the balcony. Fuck off. Come on, wait, fella. Oh, you're being stubborn, are you? Yeah. Well, Owen, come follow me. This is where the magic happens. <laughs> <laughs> As you can see here, I'm surrounded by friends and family. Drink up, dog. Drink up, my yes. friends. Drink up. He's uh, he played a big part in helping us out and getting us off the ground, didn't he? <laughs> no! <laughs> come on, get your pants on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I remember. The boys saying we should take Jay out to do merch for us, and I was like, I don't know about this. I'm not sure if you can count. And then he ended up being well, like one of the best things that ever happened to the band. Um, and he's not afraid to get his willy out at any opportunity as well, um, which is always funny. Uh, watching him shock people. After a nice, really great like year and a bit of touring um, for best in uh, for best in town, we decided it was kind of a no-brainer that we decided that we were just going to go with Jason again. Oh no, it's going to make it sound like that. Number nineteen hit. That's it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can divide nineteen by. Oh, oh someone just said. Oh god. Two. <laughs> oh, Two someone just again. said. Oh god, not Oasis. <laughs> Who said that? I don't know, someone here. Bill Gallagher. That song sounds like the way You know, whether or not you think, oh, maybe you should maybe spread your, you know, spread yourself a little bit further afield and maybe try something like Pastures New again. We just, we'd had such a good experience with him and he'd had such a positive effect on us with Best in Town and the, like, the impact he'd had on the songs that we'd written for that, like instantly, that we just felt it was just, it made complete sense for us to just go back in there and do it with him uh, again. The issue then, of course, that we would parted ways with Epitaph as well, and we've moved management um, going into the Hope sort of cycle as well, which uh, in itself brought about the idea of the pledge, which we, first time we heard about it, we were a little bit skeptical and cynical. We didn't know what it was like, what it was like everybody else. When you hear about it for the first time, you think, what, you just ask people for money and they give it for you for nothing. Um, where, of course, it's not the case, that's not the case at all. You got the devil! And it's the most, uh, it's the most like distilled example of demand, in my opinion. I think it's just you know, if if the people don't want it, it's not, it doesn't, it does, the product doesn't get made. So um, we went, obviously, we went ahead with the, with that pledge, got a bit of flack for it, but it was just an absolute runaway success, and it blew our minds how quickly it went. It came, it came about, and like was successfully completed. We were out in Europe with Limp Bizkit. I can remember, I think it was Portugal in Bilbao was the night it went live. And within, I think it was like six hours, we'd made like half of what we needed, which kind of blew our minds away. It was, it's that, that, that kind of like support that they feel that the fans wanted more music. It, that it was really kind of like heartwarming. Camera. It's really painful. I just tried to get his age from him. Oh crap! It's it's not even that that, that one occasion that the fans have pulled us out of the shit. Basically, it, you know that pledge campaign, if anything, brought us closer to our fans. We got to meet so many amazing people through it, just from doing house gigs, DJs. Uh, this this song's called. Uh, 
Hugh Stevens subhuman scum. <laughs> Doing the meet and greets at all the shows and stuff like that. That I think that's when a lot was kind of a lot, a lot, a lot of bonding happened between fans and, and the band. I think. I remember the first pledge thing we did was go to Bristol Zoo, right? So the pledge people said to us, give us a list of things other bands had done and said, is there any of those you don't want to do? And we said, we're happy to do whatever. If anybody wants to do any of this stuff with us, awesome. And then they asked us, Was there any, is there anything that you want to do that you haven't done? And we were like, we haven't been to the zoo together ever, boys. We should go to the zoo and ask, do any, you know, do any kids or fans or whatever want to come with us. And they sold out straight away. Like 10 people said, yes, I want to go to the zoo with the blackout, which sounds crazy. But I remember getting there the first day and thinking, oh, is it just going to be us six talking to each other and them 10 just standing about? But we integrated like, straight away. Like we, I don't remember really speaking to any of the boys for the rest of the day, just like interacting with the people that came with us. And we had a great day. And then um, I got a call. I was about to do pre-production with the band I was going to go to Wales and I got a call from Sean and then the phone started ringing with Claire, their manager and loads of other people. I was like, this is weird. And they called me and said, um, yeah, Snoz has broken his collarbone, the drummer. This is the day, the day before we start. And I was like, really? I thought they were winding me up and... And right at the end is, are you faster than a cheetah? So I was like, yeah, Whoa, I break my arm. I, I can do that. So uh, we were all doing it, we were all running, and about two weeks before, I'd had some new jeans off Levi's, and they were really tight, and I was like, I can still do this for them? Nah, man. Nah, worst decision ever. So I, I went for it, and I was flat out, and then I, I hit the floor at like 32 kilometers an hour, I think. Because growing up in the 80s, I loved Miami Vice, so I, I know every time I go to fall, do a forward rollout into it, innit? Being a Miami Vice fan, so I did that. But I'm a bit bigger now than I was when I was a kid. So as I landed, I did a forward roll and landed on my shoulder, and I just pushed everything forward and popped my my uh, my collarbone up. And this is four days before we're going to record the album Hope. We never had setbacks or anything from the early point of of things. Uh, <laughs> it was more to where we were established, like our bassist almost killing himself by falling backwards out of a, a bus in an airport, a drummer breaking his arm by trying to race a cheetah, or there's a motto, <laughs> it's a motto with a blackout, which is, if it can go wrong, it will go wrong. As soon as I did it, within, by the time I got to the hospital, I'd already been texting. I text uh, Phil, and I text uh, my drum tech at the time, Sam, I was like, if you can do these things, this would be class, because there's no way I'm gonna be able to play. For, cause, Two weeks later, we were going to A Studios in London, which is where they done like the Band Aid song and stuff like that. And it was, we got it quite cheap. And Jason was like, "Oh, Jason called in some favor, some favors," and we were like, "And I was like, we need to do this no matter what happens. Don't worry about me. I don't. It doesn't. I'm gutted. I'm not gonna make an album, but it needs to be done. Like we need to get it, get it done. And that's why we went with with the two drummers we did then. We went down to the rehearsal room in Wales and taught Tom 11 songs, and Snoz really helped him. And he never mentioned it. Snoz never felt sorry for himself. Never even mentioned it. He's like, yeah, I'm helping Tom. So cool. And then we went to air and we did the drums in three days. And Tom had only learned those drums two days ago. So it's a lot of work, a lot of work for me and for Tom. And by the end of it, Tom had hurt his wrist. Got repetitive strain injury in his wrist. Or it been, had been rimming a snare too much. I don't think he's really played drums like that again. I think we broke him. Seriously, he's, I felt so bad. So the album, I think the album broke Tom. You could see every time like, we'd play Hope, the song Hope live, and a couple of the other songs off that record live, you'd see it every time we play it with the people and how much it meant to them. And there'd be a really special reaction to that kind of material. And that's cool, because it was obviously, you know, you want that, you want your, you want your songs and your like expressions to like have some sort of chord with people. So to see it happen, you don't, you never expect it to make that much of an impact on someone. I suppose you don't really think it's going to have that sort of fundamental issue to somebody. But if it did, and if it helps, you know, people are telling us that it like saved their lives, and 
changed their lives and made them friends and you know brought them stuff and if it wasn't for you guys and to hear that is it's amazing and it makes you feel brilliant but at the same time it's like how do you respond you can't say what well, thanks we decided to document stuff just so we would have stuff to look back on i guess like we never we ne we didn't we've never expected anything we've got right so we've we never thought we'd get to the level we we got to we never thought, like I never thought I'd play with monitors, like, but I did. And then, yeah, it would just be one goal after another, so. <laughs> we just thought if we filmed everything ourselves, we could look back at this when we're old men and then it's proof to our families and stuff that we were in a band or whatever. Pretend you're running at the marathon and you wave to your relatives. And speed up, you know what to slow down, and at the end, you've got to hang two babies over the edge of a balcony. <laughs> Take over our lives! Turn the darkness into light! That is keeping you away! Before the fire! Before the fire! Break! Yeah, the, the blackout. All bands now film in the studio all the time. They're just trying to get you, and then they try and wind you up, and try and get you to say things to make them laugh and show up. I'm easy to wind up because I'll show off, and I kind of want to make them laugh. And they're trying to get me to say stuff and then go, oh! Like things that you just, it's, it's things happen in the studio that if, that they don't make sense out of the studio. I remember like just going to the ferry for the first time to get over to like, over to France and like cameras out because like it's a big thing. So yeah, I just filmed everything we could. And... When we started the band, we kind of, we had old like DV cameras and we kind of just, we filmed lots of shows just to kind of, you know, have, have some proof that we actually play these shows because not a lot, lot of people turned up to, to watch them. And then the next album I did was the party one. And we did that in Bath, in Distiller Studios, which really posh, nice studios. And um, that was good. Wap, wap, wow. Let this be a moral to anybody who's in a band. Don't make a happy record. People don't like to see you happy. How dare you smile? Don't go and have fun with your friends, especially in foreign countries, because you'll be slagged off for it. And it will be the end of your career instantly. Yes, we did start the party then. Um, which wasn't greatly received. Well, I loved it. I loved it. There's two songs about partying on it. Start the party and a song called Sleep When You're Dead. And yeah, people then went, oh, it's their party record. It's just got two, all the other songs sounded like blackout songs that could have been on Hope or, or We Are The Dynamite. Everything was so lined up for us that we just thought it was gonna be just plain sailing. It was the first record we'd ever done where we'd stayed on the same management, the same label. You know, everything was exactly the same as it was for the previous cycle. And so we just thought, well, great. I mean, we just record the record that we want to make. We release it and we just, we start up again. We go from where we left off and we push on to the next level. Well, the thing is, see, we never, we've never aimed for one sound really, right? Like my favourite band and a lot of the boys' favourite bands is Faith No More, right? And and they they didn't have one sound. There was no one sound. And this is the thing, people are like, oh you it's like the band didn't know what they wanted to be. No, the band knew what they wanted to be. They wanted to be everything they liked. Like we wanted to be every song. Like if somebody came in with something of super metal and we all liked it, we were gonna make a metal song. If somebody comes in writing a good pop song that we all like, we're gonna write a good pop song. Thanks, Bob. So what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? We're going to go in a poo and then... Right, are we driving back in Bob's car or someone else's car to the house? Bob's car. After he's had a poo, let's drive back. Should we have a cup of tea? <laughs> <laughs>
we're going to be set up tonight and we're going to try and record some drums to listen to tomorrow morning. That's the plan. And we're going to do some rehearsal next door. We Jason, see how you so the cock. Some of album didn't really connect. I mean, we want, they, wanted to, they wanted to do a reaction album to Hope. So that Hope was a bit like, this is, this is where we're at and it's hard and it's a struggle. And I think they raised money on pledge for it. And, you know, the fans pay for that album. And without that, they wouldn't have been able to make one. There's no budgets around to make a proper album anymore. Yeah, I mean, we decided to make, what we wanted to do, going into it, going into Start the Party, there was a definite decision to actually make a, to make a record that was more ballsy than Hope. We'd appreciated that a lot of, you know, a few of the songs on Hope were quite soft, quite gentle, quite, you know, a little bit more of a dynamic to it. And we thought, well, let's just go straight down the middle and, you know, bring the riffs back and bring everything together like that. By the same token, then, we were obviously, you know, that much older, that much more kind of like experienced, mature, and we're like coming off the back of a really successful record. And we just wanted to write a big rock record. We were listening to a lot of big rock bands and that had its effect on us. When do we start vocals? Next week. Oh, we're good. Listen, this week, you want? No, I do. It's not in there. Oh yeah. <laughs> I can't see him, but I can hear him. Let's hear the Tom section, please. Yeah. Um, just put the chorus real quick. Yeah? With the, with the click. With the click? Yeah. And just going to keep that kind of nod to it all the way through. Just a bit boom, boom, yeah? It's the record we wanted to make, and it's definitely the record you know, it's a strong record. I think there's some really good songs on there. But it just, it didn't catch with a lot of people, I don't think. Because well, we'd done two and we'd obviously gone and shot the video in Ibiza and we were smiling in it. People um, didn't like it. To us ending up in Ibiza, drunk on a boat, with him screaming on top of his lungs, we going in a fucking cave. Uh, he's... Uh, I've never met a person like him. Stop it. Oh, it's, right, right. It's, it's freezing out. I'm the best there. Yeah. Oh, I'm the best there. Oh, oh. Right there. Right then, boys. I think they get some video ideas. I don't want to be cold in Bolton again. No, 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 no more no, warehouses, no, 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 thanks. And we can't do any around here because it's, it's constantly cold in there. Yeah, so. let's just go on all day. Just take the money for the video. Yeah. And just have a laugh. Us, just go us, have just, a laugh. Just go and have a laugh for the money, yeah. Where though? Ibiza, I reckon. Yeah. Ibiza. Oh. Anyone know anyone out there we can. Which is like a constant like party man. Yeah, someone who can hook us up like. Um, boys? I know just the man. <laughs> When we were doing Start the Party, we'd written the songs and the song Sleep When You're Dead, the lyrics, we, me and Gavin sat down to write the song and we were like, why don't we write the song from what we think Pritchard's point of view is? Because Pritchard is one of the nicest people I've ever met, right? Who parties harder than anyone I've ever met, who trains harder than anyone I've ever met and does ridiculous things. Like he's doing like an... <clears throat> he has an ultra marathon coming up, which is two marathons, so that's 52 miles running, five mile swim, then a 250 mile bike ride. He's just doing that because he wants to do like he wants to do it. So before sort of start the party came out, we would been like discussing with the management about where the finances were, and we'd had a pretty good year, um, and there were sort of discussions about sort of having a slightly, like a bit of a pay rise really. Um, and it was something that we'd asked about sort of tentatively and when they were sort of okayed initially, we thought, well, you know, is this money actually gonna be there to sustain for us over, you know, the next few months? And we were told, yeah, it'll be great. There'll be enough to pay you all that amount of money every month until the following June, even if we didn't play another gig between then and June, apart from what had already been booked. And what basically transpired was those shows that were already booked were pretty much all we did do. And so we came to, we came to the June um, without any sort of real forewarning, thinking, okay, well, where is this, you know, 
what's happening with this? And then all of a sudden we get an email saying, guys, this, you know, what are we going to do about this money? There's not enough to pay, you know, to keep paying you this amount. We've down to however much. To which we'd gone, well, why were we not, why wasn't this flagged like sort of earlier in the thing? And it sort of set in motion a bit of a, a bit of a spiral really, where once we, from that was sort of the, maybe the final straw in our relationship with raw power and maybe just made the decision then that we decided to go on, our, go on alone, which then, sort of slapped us with two pretty sizable debts, one from the record label and one from the management company on like unpaid finances. And they were the, they were the sort of crippling blows really. They put us on our knees and although we did a great amount to salvage that situation, it never really got us, you know, we'd lost enough momentum and lost enough time and lost enough money <laughs> that the three things combined meant that we were sort of in a bit of a doomed state, I think. Personally, I, I'd been, I'd been thinking about it before it was brought up. There's always a shelf life on any band, unless you're Stone Roses or I don't know Stone Roses, um, the Rolling Stones, or some massive band like that. Back from a period where bands were massive, whereas these days I think there's a shorter shelf life on on a lot of music and a lot of bands. Uh, it's not a decision for me because I never wanted it to end. I still don't want it to end. I'm hoping this is a joke. I'm hoping this is a, a punked. The worst, longest punked of all time. Um, we were in practice and Reese. We knew Wolves was coming out, but then we kind of... I remember Reese saying that if he didn't try and find a job in a career he wanted to do now, that he'd never really get an opportunity. So after we all spoke about it, it seemed like the right thing where every, like a, a couple more people were gonna not want to do it anymore. So rather than, you know, it be off the blackout or um, me finally getting my way and it all just being about me, um, we decided like that, 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 you know, it couldn't work. It wouldn't be the blackout without all six of us. So these days, People don't buy CDs, so being in a band, the longer it goes, it's more of a struggle, I guess. And the old, older you get, the harder it is to kind of sustain a kind of, you know, a life, I guess, in a way. And then the older you get, the more you kind of want to do. You kind of want to get a house, you kind of want to have kids and whatever else. And at the time when you're making kind of, you know, less than minimum wage, it's kind of a bit hard and you kind of think, how long can I keep doing this for? So. Um, Personally, I'd been thinking it for you know a few years, thinking when's the best time. This isn't isn't the best time. I can't do it now. How about now? No, 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 no. Maybe yeah, I can possibly think about doing it now. So we kind of we did that last EP. Last EP wasn't you know minds us doing the last one, but yeah, um, I thought you know maybe call it a day after this last EP. We kind of pretty much done. Or oh, I've personally done all I wanted to do. And basically, I wanted to go my separate way with the band. I didn't want to obviously live on bad terms, and I didn't want the band to split up either. I thought they'd just keep going. But then I brought it up to the guys, and they literally, they were in total, total agreement with me. So whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know. But. I think a few of us started to feel the same, but Reese was one with the courage, I guess, to like bring it up, first of all. So I think everyone kind of knew, I think after the, the start of the party cycle. I think everyone kind of knew that it was where well, we didn't really know if we were going to do anything else. So we decided to just, because we were still writing and everything we were writing was a bit heavy, a bit darker. So I think we just decided to let's do this one last thing. Because we would, we did the, the, the last EP, we, we crowdfunded it, we got, we made it before we decided we were going to knock it on the head. But I think you just get to the point then in practice, I think someone brought it up and was like, oh, look, I don't know if I can do this anymore. Uh, am I going to? I mean, I need to start, yeah. I'm gonna need to start doing some kind of proper work, doing some proper money, because everyone's got children, houses, and all this kind of thing now. And I think it... Was anyone I, not over it? Um, no, I don't think so. I think probably Sean wasn't up for it as much. It was easier for us to just announce after Wolves came out that we were calling it a day. I remember, actually, it was the Wolves video shoot when we went back to, yeah, we were like, the sitcom soldiers are ruining this band. We need to split up. 
No, we went back after the Wallace video shoot and we put a date on it. Like we knew we were going to split up, but we didn't know when. And then after that Wolves shoot, it had nothing to do with the shoot. We were just sitting in a room together. And we'd, there, there had been weeks where we'd, weeks since it had been mentioned that none of us had just mentioned it. Cause like, I definitely wasn't going to bring it up because I didn't want it to end. But we didn't really speak about it for ages. And then I think after that Wolves video, we were all in the same hotel room and we were like, come on in, let's work out what's happening and what's next. Up until then, I'd missed my wife's birthday four years in a row. And we were having a kid, and I was like, I, d I don't want to do her to the kids. So when Reese kind of brought it up, a lot of us were thinking along the same lines. It's been something that's been going around my head for a long time, maybe even a year, you know, not concrete, but in a, just enough of a thing of like, what, well, you know, how, long, how much longer can this go on? There's this part new. That's, that's saying you, you shouldn't have done that. You enjoy this too much. But, uh, yeah, it had to be done, really. That was like the beginning of the summer in 2014, and by the end of the summer we'd had another chat and sort of had this idea of, well, let's do one more tour, the six of us, like it's always been. Let's not get, you know, let's not worry about splintering off before we just do that. We'll fit, we'll fit it in a week, so if we're working, and we've got jobs or whatever, and we just need to take a week off work, then we can. And we'll just do those. We'll do those shows, and we'll, you know, we'll draw a line under it that way. The last two was amazing. Um, yeah, we got to see see everybody one last time, I guess, before we called it a day. I'm glad we did a last tour. Um, yeah, it was amazing. We got to play some beautiful rooms, um, see a lot of friends, and obviously film the final show, which is this. And uh, yeah, it was fantastic. And I've been lucky enough to see some of the footage back, and it, and it looks it looks good. And uh, yeah, we had a great send off. It was good. It was strange. It, I can remember. I think one of the boys was talking from to Alid from Kids in Glass Houses, who just done the last show, and he said, "Whatever you do, boys, when you break up, don't do a last show. It's weird." And he said that to us, not knowing that we were calling it a day. And the first half of the tour was kind of like just a normal tour. Like when, when we fans after the show, obviously that was a lot different to what it usually was. It was, it was strange. And that, that was the weirdest thing for me about that tour was just kind of saying bye to people, I guess. Like people you become friends with over like, like the Flood, Flood of Red Boys we've probably known for like 10 years and like, Seeing them for like in Glasgow and be like, it's just the honesty is like, think, like, will we see them again? Like that was, I found that a bit strange. It was incredible. It was emotional. Uh, I met those guys ten years ago, and uh, they've been some of the best dudes I could ever know through music. I consider them like my brothers. It's funny, like people uh, from all over the world. Uh, you know, when you when you play music, you meet people through music, and it's a uh, kind of beautiful for a friendship that you create with someone. And those guys have been our oldest friends through music and I think we've been through a lot of sort of tough times, highs and lows with those dudes and to have someone you know who's making music and that you can talk to about that sort of thing is just it's a beautiful thing you can't really replicate that anywhere else it creates a bond that is just like doesn't exist. We put that uh, tour on sale obviously there was a lot of um, hype around it obviously because it was a last, last one and it's just like all the shows are selling out and stuff like Oh Christ! Why, why couldn't we've done this, you know, a while back? People, people obviously they hadn't seen us for years. They're coming out with the woodwork and stuff, and it was kind of a, a bit emotional. But it was kind of, it was probably one of the most fun tours I've done, and had the hardest one at the same time because you knew, you know, this is the end. But then at the same time you were like, this is the end. You know, I'm gonna, you know, gonna put my heart into this. And every show's gonna be, you know, you know, coming to an end. So you gotta. You can make the most of every single one of them. I think he was, I can't remember, he was a five or six. But they were, yeah, it was one of the shortest tours we ever done, but probably the most fun. Uh, we are backstage in the garage in Scotland, Glasgow, to be specific. <clears throat> My voice is fucked. <laughs> 
someone's brilliant idea to do hour and a half sets uh, and it is not set well with me but uh, day off tomorrow so hopefully I'll have a voice from Eartha coming on going on to the tour I was like it just felt like any other tour. I was like, all right, get my bags packed and stuff, getting ready. And the way this, the shows are going, they were selling out. I was like, this is cool. This is, you know what I mean? We're sell, we selling shows again. In my mind, I was like, this is wicked. We're selling shows again. It wasn't because we're not going to the end. This is why we're selling shows. It, I, in my head, I was like, this, we're selling shows again. Why are we even splitting up? This is class. The last show, that's when it, that's when it hit. The last three songs. That's when I was like, I'm never going to do this again. Never gonna play these songs live again. I may not even be on a stage ever again. And that's when it all hit home that this was real. This was happening. To the point where I, I don't even think I sung the last chorus of Save Ourselves because I was just bawling like a girl. I just want to say uh, thank you so so much for you. The my band got at least three years of playing awesome shows and doing awesome things because of you guys. You're the only guys that literally believed in us. We got a, pub a publicist, we got music videos on TV, and uh, I just wanna say thank you so much, and I'm gonna fucking miss you. I'm gonna miss you from the bottom of my heart, and I, I still don't believe it, but you know, it is what it is, so I love you boys, and thank you so much for, for my life. Going forward, I genuinely wish them all the luck in the world, and I hope they're all really, really happy with what they do next, and um, you know, they, they wouldn't be making this decision if they didn't think it was the right decision. I think it's the wrong decision, but that's just my personal selfish opinion. Um, no, all the best, and just thanks for being pals, and thanks for helping me out with Reaper and Sicily, and just being genuine guys. It's sad, man. I remember seeing the blackout in Frankfurt, uh, probably, about, probably about six years ago before I joined Yashin. I remember seeing them come on before a band supporting and they, I just thought this band is amazing. And uh, from when I was like, I don't know, 14, just absolutely, yeah, Sean inspired me to be, I don't know, the front man that I am now. And it's sad to see them go. Love, love the blackout, the blackout, the blackout. It was amazing, man. It was like, it was kind of like amazing to see, like great fun, but almost like sad at the same time. You know, you don't really know what to feel because like, it's kind of weird, weird vibe, but it's great at the same time. It is like a celebration of like what a great band they are, so That's it's cool, awesome man. to see. That's really cool. I wish you all the best for the future. I know you'll go on to doing amazing things. Um, I'm really sad that you're not like making music anymore, but I'm so like happy with the journey that you had, and I really do wish you the best of luck for the future. Okay. I'm here, Coco and I've just seen the blackout for the last time. That's it, it's over. No more blackout, I won't see them anymore now, so. I think that their music needs more to people than they know, and if it wasn't for them as a band, or them as people, then certainly a lot of me and my friends, I wouldn't know a lot of people that I know, and a lot of people like have come together through their music and got to know each other through like going to see them and stuff, so like, that's just, I don't know, I think they'll definitely be missed, like, 100% they'll be missed. I hope you know uh, how fond we are of all of you guys. Uh, as I said, you, you know, we had some amazing experiences with you and you did a lot for us. We are endlessly grateful and we wish you all the best in whatever it is uh, that you do from now on. Lots of love from most teams. I love you very, very much and I'm very grateful for letting me be a part of your whole musical career. Um, and I think we'll be friends for a lifetime to come for sure everything it's thank you i had the best time working with you ever um i honestly don't think any band has made me laugh as much as you guys have and i uh, wish you all the best of luck with everything you're doing yeah thank you for everything uh, i've had a blast working with you guys and uh, yeah all the best in the future i, was, I wanted to burst out crying i was like i think a lot of the, through the lot of the set, I could hear the boys see, because I could hear their monitors, I could hear them pulling out the songs here next, I knew he was upsetting them. And I was like, oh, this is, this is bad. And like, oh, we threw some of the set. You could see me playing it sometimes when my head is down. I think it's because I'm crying in certain parts. I'm not crying, but I'm like, I'm gutted. But I'm like, so happy it's happening, you know what I mean? It's, it's just, yeah, I think it's just one, one of, it was just one of those things. I think it was just like so happy it was happening. And then when he got to save ourselves, I was, 
fine all the way through, right, right up until well, the part where everyone jumps up. You know, the thing we stole off Slipknot. Uh, right up to that point, I was like, oh, this is it, this is the last, this is the last of it. I was like, this is gonna be, and it kind of dawned on me, and then we, play, we were playing the last bits, because I had to do the woes on my mic, I couldn't, I couldn't do them, I was like, oh, this is too hard for me. And then when it finished, I kind of, I was gutted, but I kind of felt kind of happy as well that it happened. So I was like, oh, this is amazing. So like we all went to the front, we had a photo and stuff. You could see Bob was sobbing. <laughs> that was, that was uh, like I said, I can't be in serious, so I enjoyed that bit, that was good. Um, but it was class and just to see so many people here and I could see all our family was on the, on the left-hand side and stuff and just looking at the crowd, seeing people that have been coming to the shows for years. And that's the, that was the main feature for me of the old, the old, pro, the old final tour was the fact that I seen people we haven't seen in years. Um, what's next? Uh, I have no idea. What am I doing in another band? What am I doing this band? Boys, come on. Please, I got no else place to go. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. I'm going to do some more music. I'm going to have to, I think. I don't think it's something you can just stop forever what form that takes and where that goes, I don't know. Um, I'll just do it for me to start with because it's just something you have to get out of yourself, I think. You go crazy if you can't, if you don't do it. Personally, I'm working with a friend of mine, uh, Neil Starr, from every band in South Wales. Uh, <laughs> in fact, one of the first tours we did was with his band Dopamine back in 2005, maybe, where we got chased out of Derry by uh, the IRA. I don't think they were the real IRA, but they, they, were, they were unhappy with us, let's just say that. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm working in merch really at the moment, doing like designs and helping run his business and that's, that's me at the moment. It's, uh, well, and for the foreseeable future really. But uh, I've kind of been lucky that I've managed to fall on my feet with something I still enjoy doing, which is design work and general, I don't know, management of, of, of projects, so. I'm currently in the middle of a flying instructor's course, so uh, that's what I'd love to do. So hopefully it's gonna pay well enough for me to be able to do it. That's my biggest panic at the moment. Obviously, can be self-employed self again, so I could be in the same position as being a band where you work. Like, there's no reliance on a, a regular income, but yeah, that's what I'm doing, so. Next, personally, it's a bit, you know, don't know what to do really, because uh, a third of my life I was in a band. I'd love to keep doing music, but obviously it's kind of, you know, it's a hard industry to crack, and we kind of did, and, and things went the way they did. But um, I'd love to keep doing that. I'd love to keep doing um, maybe music uh, for film and TV and stuff like that. It's a, it's a good hobby at the moment I'm doing. Um, Currently, I'm doing uh, reception and admin work in a care home because I want to kind of do stuff to help people um, as well as, you know, helping myself in the long term. It's nice to kind of give something back and, you know, it's a bit rewarding getting out of bed, kind of, you know, when you're going to help people because obviously being in a band, it's kind of a bit all about yourself, kind of promoting yourself and, you know, me, me, me kind of thing, but it's nice to kind of pay you forward, I guess. And, and um, hopefully make a career out of it in the long term. So, My, my goal in life is to try, to try and earn as much money now for my family as I possibly can. Doesn't matter what I do, no. Um, I, um, I, would, I would like to get back to working with, with kids and stuff. You do a lot of youth working, that's what I used to do, but at the moment it's, uh, it's a bit all up in here in South Wales because all the youth services are being shut down and blah, blah, blah. So I'm, I'm currently working with the Welsh Ambulance Service. So I'm, Currently working for the NHS, so yeah, so I'm like still playing music. Uh, I play in a covers band and stuff. I play in a wedding band. Anyone's got a wedding coming up? I know a band you can have. Yeah, so I, I'm hopefully I'll always keep keep playing music and stuff. But it's it's time to move on. I've lived. I like I say to people like I see people now. They're like, oh, what are you doing yourself now? And I tell them what's going on, and they're like, oh, and you sad? I'm like, no, I, this is the next part of my life now. I gotta carry on with the next part of my life.